uh, this first platoon took out a patrol and they came back in late that afternoon and they had a corporal missing. And um, couldn't find him. So I took out a patrol the next, I, my platoon, I took my platoon out on patrol the next morning. Uh, and Jap <coughs> Japanese made sure that we found him. So not too far from where we were at, they had killed him and they had drug him out and put him in the middle of the trail. They took and took stuck sticks in his eyes like that, killed him, sticks in his eyes, cut his sticks off, put it in his mouth, and mutilated his body and put it right in the center of the trail where we would find it. And I know they were in the out in the bushes looking at us when we started out that morning with the trail, but I had every man in my platoon come by and look and see what they'd done. And it mutilated his body. And sometimes it takes that in order to get, to, get, to let people know they can't mess around, they have to take action and take action quickly. And I wanted them to see what what a cruel bunch of people we were fighting. And it's un, un, unbelievable how cruel those Japs could be. And, uh, <laughs> Texas. Uh, I served along with my three brothers four years uh, in, a, in the Marine Corps. For them, in five years, I served in the Marine Corps. Uh, three years overseas. Uh, I actually enlisted in the Marine Corps April the 1st, 1941, nine months before Pearl Harbor. Uh, my twin brother and I enlisted in, from Beaumont, Texas. Uh, we went through basic training and was uh, serving in a guard company out of San Diego at Point Loma Naval Base. Uh, when the war broke out, when Pearl Harbor occurred. And after, when the war broke out, things changed uh, tremendously. Uh, we, uh, was shipped out of the guard company into a uh, training area uh, in San Diego and organized the 9th Regimental Marine Unit. What we did on top of Hill uh, 1000, we dug foxholes around the top of the island like that and we had connecting trenches uh, between one foxhole and the other like that. That was a fact <clears throat> you could, you had a way if you're, if you're, uh, if they drop a bomb or uh, 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 artillery shell on top of your your unit where you were at, you could run out in the connecting trench, you know, and get a little, give us a little more protection. But I remember one thing. We had 
four or five Mormon boys from Utah and Idaho up in there. And one was in my outfit by the name of Heath. And during the battle, a, a, a shell fell right on the back part of the foxhole that where, where we were we were at, and we had to run out in the connecting trench. We had to crawl out in the connecting trench, you know, and that was important. And Heath called out in the and. A shell fell real close to where he was at, and I knew he was dead. But when it quietened out a little bit, I went to saw him in the standing foxhole. I reached down to pull him out of the foxhole, and his arm came loose from his body. Shows you what kind of a condition people were in when they were hit with a deal like that. It was, it, it was a bad memory. I had lots of them like that, but I remember that in particular. My twin brother and me were in the first wave to hit the beach on Guam. And um, We run across some real opposition on Guam uh, right from the very start. Uh, we made our way in to the, off of the beach and, and uh, started the, the moving out and uh, it was real, Healy uh, type, uh, small mountain like deals and valleys uh, right on Guam. And we start taking it as we were moving out. And uh, do you want me to keep on with that type of steel? Sir, I mean it when I say you're doing perfect. You're saying the true reality of what happened. People need to know the truth. Okay. Well, on Guam we moved in, and I remember the first real hill like we we hit. My the second platoon was in the center, and the first platoon was to the right, and. My twin brother had, he was the platoon sergeant, uh, one on the right, move in and, and as we moved up on the, we moved up a hill and I looked over and he was, his platoon was going through a kind of a valley like, you know, and out in the center of that, that uh, valley like there was a, a sharp hill right in the middle of it, you know, like that. and. Me and my lieutenant was up on top of this hill. We were looking down, and I, I looked down, and I, <clears throat> I saw a Jap with his rifle coming around the, the this little hill like that. And then on the other side of the little hill was my brother. And he was coming around. The, on the side, looked looked like what looked like they were fixing the meat, you know. I told Hyde, Lieutenant Hyde, I said, "Look down there, look down there." I said, "My brother's is, is fixing to either kill a Jap or a Jap's gonna kill him and come around." He hollered down there, tried to, but it was too far. Ray Ray couldn't hear him, you know. 
And he just walked around and man, I was I was shocked. I was afraid he was the job's gonna get him before he got them. They was gonna meet, you know, like that. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> my brother turned around and popped him, got him, <laughs> and surrendered. It didn't didn't even he just mowed for the guys to come on up, you know. But oh no, it just uh, it's like that. Just <laughs> I, I was so pleased <laughs> that he got him, you know. We start moving now. There's the first platoon and the second platoon was in third platoon was in reserve, and we were going out. First platoon on the right, second platoon on the left. My twin brother was the was the, the platoon sergeant of the first platoon, and I was platoon sergeant of the second platoon. And as we moved out, going up that hill, a bunch of trees all in it like this, and going up. The Japanese waited. They was holding the top of the hill. And they waited until we got up to the military crest of the hill, which is a little more than halfway up the hill. It's up between the halfway point and the top of the ridge. We were in that category moving up the hill, far in movement as we go up the hill. And all of a sudden, they start running over the top of the hill, far and down among us were machine guns and throwing grenades down among us like that. And it got quite a few, well I lost quite a few out of my platoon and he lost quite a few. I looked over to where he was at, I could see, uh, I could see him part time over and I looked over and I saw him jump and fall to the ground. And I knew he was hit, but I had the responsibility uh, of this action over here. There's no way that I could do it. And I kept on, I looked back at him and he crawled up behind a big rock as a hill. And what had happened is he got shot through the, I didn't know this until we took the top of the ridge and we killed all the Japs that we could kill. And I redistributed some ammunition and stuff and so that uh, somebody else could take over. And I run over there to see if I could find him, but the stretcher bearers had already came up and took him out. And he got shot right that time, right through the, uh, right underneath the knee, right through the flesh part of that leg. And uh, so they took him back to the aid station back down there and took a little sulfonilamide powder and put it in each one and put a wrapping around it. Four days later, he came back up to the front and took his platoon over again. I mean, he came back up and, and uh, so um, he was shot the second time shot through the, after we secured the island, the pictures in that book and there where we secured the island and everything. Uh, and K Company was given the, the job of cleaning up the by ones that we bypassed, bypassed. And uh, in the bushes and caves, stuff like that. And that's where he got shot the second time. He got shot through the back, took it, two vertebrae out of his back and he didn't have a chance to, I kept him in a tent near the beach, near the little deal. From the 21st of August to the 27th, he died on the 27th uh, there on, on uh, Guam. They had a tent set up and the, the corpsman people were working on him. But after they got through working on him, well, 
they they knew that he was wasn't gonna make it really, because he they couldn't get him off the island. There's so many, you can't imagine how many wounded it was, you know. And uh, I kept on telling him continuously. I said, I'm gonna get you off this island, one way or the other. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get you back to Pearl Harbor and get you. I tried to, you know, talk to him and tell him and, you know, but he was realistic. He says, very realistic about it. He, he said, well, this is twice they got me, you know. He said, I know when we was there in that little tent, just him and me, the sergeant that took over his, his platoon came to visit him come down to see him, and, and he said, uh, I remember Ray saying to him, said, Jim, uh, Jim says, Ray says, they're going to, says, they, you're going you're gonna to get, oh, says, you're going to make it, you, you're going to make it. He says, Jim, he says, seem like they got my number. Every way I step, they let me have it. He says, uh, uh, you just make sure that that, Platoon gets enough of water, get the water, and get ammunition. Said they'll do you a good job. Said they did me a wonderful job. And he says uh, that was on about the 22nd of August, and and he, I kept him right there in that little tent uh, uh, until he died on the 27th, and. Uh, and we buried him the first time there on, on Guam. And uh, later, after I came, I, I transferred after, after he was killed. Well, I transferred from the second, first, the third division to the second division. That was the unit that my two other brothers was in. They were, at that time, they were on Saipan. They had took Saipan and, and uh, uh, but in preparation for a transfer, I, I chose, there was two of us, Sergeant Thompson and me were up to be uh, made second lieutenants as a, and if I'd have stayed with K Company, I would have been a second lieutenant. Uh, but f about three months later, K Company hit Iwo Jima and every single officer and senior NCO was killed out of K Company on Iwo Jima. So, I guess I would, uh, I might have been a second lieutenant, but I'd have been dead, you know, so. Anyway, I transferred and stayed another year overseas, and um, we made the landing on Okinawa after that. So from the 21st to the 27th, Yeah. was he conscious, you know, every day, or was he quiet? He was, he was in and out. I mean, he, um, I know we were close enough that when the foreign would start, and it was still going on, don't mean, after he was run, through the cleaning up and the killing off of the deer, it was foreign every night, and a lot of times bullets would come through the tents, a lot of them that come through. And I used to tell him, I said, Ray, he would just go into orbit. I mean, he just real jerky. I said, you know, I would, and the, I'd get over and lay on top of him on, on the couch, I mean, on the cot. We both had a cot with no mattress on it, just a cot. And and I lay on top, I said, Ray, 
quiet down, quiet down. I, I said, the next bullet coming here is going to be mine. You've already took two, the next bullet is mine. I said, I just quiet down. I kind of lay on top of him when he do, and he quietened down, you know. And he, uh, I can't tell you how uh, near death he was. For he held out long. I mean, he 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 was a tough umber. I mean, long at the last he was. He said, Drexel, this is Drexel King calling. Do you receive me? Do you receive me? He laid there a little bit and he says, I receive you loud and clear. Disregard, disregard going to Pearl Harbor. And he rolled over and died. I mean, he just... Uh, It just, I can't, but uh, he was one more brave individual. And he fought it to the last breath. And uh, I think my other two brothers would have done the same thing. And I think you would have as well. You're, you're oh, also a very know. tough I'm a, individual. I'm a weenie kind of a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt that. You know David You know David and Goliath? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel, that's what I feel like right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're, you are a very... Uh, well, I've, I've had a... You're a giant in, in a no, good way. No, no, I, I tell you, I... Uh, the good Lord has been extremely good to me. If Ray had survived the war, what would he have ended up doing with his life, do you think? Yes, I'm so glad you asked me that question. He and I was, was different. He, uh, he was smart as he could be. He was much smarter in school than I was. He made better grades, you know. And I think at the end, I think he would have probably been, uh, went on to to be a college professor or something, you know, that would, uh, actually in his pack, after, after he was wounded, he had a book in his in his book. Uh, being here, the book being here, yeah. It, it was in his it was in his pack, and he he loved to read. He loved uh, love. We were just we looked alike, and we uh, jitterbug a little bit alike, you know. He and I used to. Uh, dance at the Sherman's Dine and Dance in San Diego, you know, do the jitterbug, get on the floor, you know, and, and give the girl a whirl, a whirl, and he'd step off and I'd step on, they'd never know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, if there was a little town on Guam that it had just one little store and, and a community, so-called deal, and a little park. And it had uh, ropes for the kids, you know, to swing on and stuff like that. And we got close to that area where we heard a lot of far shots and stuff up there. So the captain took our company, C, K Company, up to that point. And in their little, little so-called community, like, they had a, a, kids had swing ropes with a 
with a log up high where they, they, they swing, tie the ropes to the up swing. They swing like that. And when we did get up there, after a lot of foreign and stuff got up there, and there was two people hanging by the feet. One of them was the, the I don't know, the mayor or the sheriff or the, some of them, they're hanging upside down from that pole across the deal to two people. One of them, I think, was, they said was the mayor or the, or some important person there. They was hanging up there down and both of their throats were cut and they'd been hanging there for all day or a couple of days. And I tell you, it set off or <laughs> made a real impression on our our company. We didn't we tightened up quite a lot after that because we it was a bad thing. It's where the kids place and two people, two of the adults hanging by the feet up there with their throats cut. And so I remember that after we after we left there. Uh, we we secured, I don't remember how we got it, but I fired my pistol more that day after the distraction short deals. Me and, and Captain Crawford both, we fired our pistols that day. And uh, I remember he, he was so upset about that, you know, that little community like that, hang the, the mayor or the the police chief upside down with his throat cut, you know. But you talk about cruel, they they were cruel people. You can't you could you can't take a chance with your enemy like that. Tell you the truth, I was a kind of a cheater. Like when I started coming back home, uh, I, I had a forty-five pistol that that I got on Water Canal, you know, and uh, my captain knew I had it, and I carried it all through the war. Every operation I was in, I had that forty-five pistol. And I guess I was the only one except the captain that had a forty-five pistol. And I told him about it. I told him about it uh, up front. And he told me, he said, now, Buck, you know you're not supposed to have it, uh, a forty-five. pistol. You're not supposed to have the pistol. He was the only one who was supposed to have a pistol, a forty-five pistol. But I kept it in my sea bag most of the time when I wasn't in combat. And when I was in combat, I had them old, big old coveralls that got the big pockets. So I, 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 I kept it out of the scabbard in there a lot of times. Sometimes I kept it in the scabbard, but most time out of sight. I, I, I had that forty-five pistol in. In my, in my pocket, practically all the time, you know. And uh, did you did you ever have any opportunities to fire it? Oh yeah, I fired it a number of times, uh, but uh, I put one notch on it. And one day, my uh, twin brother that was killed came by my tent. And he says, "Hey, let me have your pistol." And we going on patrol. He knew I had it, so um, I gave it to him. When it came back, it had another notch on the handle, in, it, on the handle on it. So I know it had two notches on the handle on it. And when, and when I got out of the service and my son grew up, I told him he could have. 
the pistol in the scabbard uh, when he got 21 years old. And uh, the day he was 21 years old, <laughs> I was out in the backyard. He says, he came out where I was at. He said, what's that? <laughs> what's that? I want it. He knew, he knew that he would get. So I gave him the scabbard and, and the, the pistol all, and uh, uh, he had it. I guess his wife has still got it now. He, he died here uh, a couple of years ago with a stroke and everything. But he, but uh, I'm sure it meant the world to him. But uh, but you know that's pretty close fighting for a 45 to be effective. Yeah. When when you used it, was it on a patrol or what? What happened when? What what was going on? Huh. When you had to use it, when you got your notch, what, do you remember what happened? Yeah, I remember what happened when I put that notch on it. I hate to tell this, but it was very shortly after that, that uh, other episode I was telling you about. As we started moving out, There was a move out by, we start moving into a bunch of big trees. And in the, in the, the type of ground where we were at, the trees had high roots running on top of the ground. The roots was in the ground, but a lot of the roots was above the ground. Some of them uh, 18 inches high. You know, a big tree, you see the roots running out like that. And uh, we got pretty close to it. I looked up and my beer arm was on the left hand side, he had a beer arm. And uh, I heard a little noise and I looked up and thought the root had a root right on each, on each side on top of the ground like that. And I saw a barrel coming up over the, over the, the, the root like that. He would just, Burn his barrel up where he'd get where he, he was, could see it, you know. And all of a sudden, when I saw it, I hollered at my beer arm on the left hand side. I said, Look, look. He looked at it, he emptied a whole round out of BR 12, 9, 12 uh, bullets right at that root and right at the point where it was at the and I, when he did, I broke and run on this side of the deal, a run around. And I hate to say it, but behind that big old tree, there was a Jap. There's two Japs, and one of them looked like a, a woman, at least had long hair. I don't know. But anyway, there was two of them. One of, one of them there was two jobs back there, and both of them got killed. They got killed. <laughs> you know, yep. He and I killed both of them. I guess what you want to say, but uh, we had to take them out. Yeah, I mean, because if you left them, they would have killed. It would have killed someone else. Well, they had the ability to put the barrel over that root. We saw the barrel of the gun coming over, who we fixing to mow us down, you know. But when I hauled it at Adam, Adam's his last name, and he emptied a whole clip of ammunition 
right at that central point. He he just chopped up that big root <laughs> going in there and and up above it. So I don't know if it, they were killed from that deal of when he run on that side and I run around on this side of where we we um, they were both killed. So, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. The Japanese wasn't stupid. They 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 they, they were trained and they had uh, one mission and that is to kill their enemy. Uh, uh, and you couldn't give them any edge or anything like that. I uh, and they, uh, to tell you the truth, they didn't beg for leniency or anything. They they were they were tough competitors. I have run them out of caves and with hand grenades and with flamethrowers. Uh, um, uh, and very seldom you will find one that will hold his hands up and surrender. You, uh, hardly ever. They don't. They don't. They, didn't, they were taught not to do that. You know, they would fight to the death. You know, so they, they did. That's the reason they made such a tough enemy. You know, they they either killed, they were either, they killed or were killed, practically, you know. They <laughs>